So I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Susan Shanian. I'm a sheep and goat specialist for University of Maryland Extension. Our first webinar in our worm webinar series is parasites and their biology. We're going to cover species, the different species of parasites, life cycles, whether they're pathogenic, and their interactions. And I think this is the foundation. You have to understand a lot of this about parasites if you hope to control them on your farm. We're not out to eradicate parasites. We need to be able to control them so that they don't cause problems in terms of uh, animals dying or suffering uh, production losses or just or failing to thrive. And there's not an ABC approach like the one person had indicated they'd been given a recommendation to deworm every six weeks. That's not going to work and we need to talk about maybe why that won't work and as we talk about again starting with the parasites themselves you might start to understand why that's not really going to work. It may actually lead to a false sense of security, will actually increase the rate by which the anthelmintics become resistant to the, to the uh, the worms become resistant to the anthelmintics. And I tend to use the word anthelmintic a lot, and that's really just a fancy term for a dewormer. A dewormer. So I apologize if I use that term a lot. When I go to scientific meetings, that's always the term they're using. But I just mean dewormer. The pharmaceuticals are drugs that we use to kill worms. Let's start all the way at the beginning and talk about what a parasite is. Basically, it's one organism that lives off the resources produced or collected by another organism. I always compare it to a kid that graduated from college and goes out and gets a job and then eventually comes back home and kind of lives off mom and dad. Mom does the laundry and cooks for them. But you know, one kid, if, particularly if they're help around the house, that's not a problem. If that same child brings back his, his girlfriend, his baby, and his dog, that gets to be a little much. And that's what parasites are like. It's the quantity that's a problem. Because parasites are a normal part of the system of animals, including our own systems. In fact, we've made a mistake cleansing ourselves too much of parasites and bacteria. There's actually a pharmaceutical company that is going to start packaging worms, parasites, that can be purchased to treat certain diseases. Because the theory is that parasites have a very important role in immunity and we've cleansed our systems of them. So again, with our sheep and goats and, and other livestock, the goal is not to create parasite-free animals. And so we just need to understand a lot about parasites. The picture you see here is of the barber pole worm, and this is going to be one we very much focus on. It's in the abomasum, which is the true stomach. This is actually one of the few worms that you can really see. A lot of the other ones are a lot smaller. So that's the barber pole worm. And we'll actually have quite a few pictures of the barber pole worm. Now, there's two types of parasites that affect our livestock. The internal parasites, which we also call endoparasites, the ones that live inside of the animal and the external or ectoparasites that live on the blood or lay eggs on the hide or in the nose of the animal. Pictured here is a kid, which is a tick that affects sheep. Significant problem, particularly in wool producing sheep and external parasites in general can be a big problem, but we're not going to focus on them in this series. It's not to say they can't be a problem, because they can, but we're going to focus on the internal parasites for this webinar series. Now, as we talk about internal parasites, there's basically two kinds of those. Helminths, which are multicellular parasites, and these are what most of us think about. These are kind of our worms, uh, nematodes, cestodes, and trematodes. We're going to talk about all three of those. But I'll basically tell you we're going to focus on the nematodes. By far, they're the problem. Protozoa is another type of parasite. 
the difference is they're single cell. Uh, the one that we think of here, and really the only one that's very important, is coccidia. And coccidia on some farms and at some times of the year can be a far more significant problem than the nematodes or roundworms. The other ones, giardia and cryptosporium, tend to be more of a zoonotic issue. I mean, there's often a concern if, if animals are transmitting these two protozoan parasites to people. It is possible for to get them, but coccidia is really the one that we focus on. Again, another picture of the barber pole worm. Quite a handsome devil. OK, so we're going to talk about the helmets, the parasitic worms. These are the ones that cause the a lot of problems with our sheep and goats. Again, another picture of a barber pole worm. You're going to get sick of seeing the barber pole worm, you're going to get sick of hearing about it, but that's to emphasize how very important this particular parasite is. Within this classification, we again, we have three types. The nematodes, which are what we call the roundworms, and this is where most of the worms of concern, this is the category they fall into. The cestodes, which is just the fancy name or scientific name for tapeworms, and trematodes, which is just a scientific name for flukes. Okay, we're going to start and spend most of the time talking about the nematodes or the roundworms. There's approximately one million species of roundworms. And obviously, we as human beings can also be affected by roundworms and worms in general. Over 28,000 they actually have described. One of the things I want you to notice is out of 28,000 that they've specifically described, only 16,000 are parasitic. So not every worm out there causes problems. Again, it's like that child that came back home. Just because he came back home doesn't mean he's going to cause problems, even if he's kind of freeloading. So roundworms obviously are round. They're elongated. Again, they're what we think of when we use the term worm. You know, we don't deworm an animal if it has coccidia. It's not a worm. And they don't look like worms. They're, they're microscopic single-cell protozoa. These are the worms, even though many of these are microscopic. And if you were to cut open an animal, you'd have a hard time seeing them. The barber pole worm is the largest of these worms, and that's why it's more easily seen. In terms of seeing these worms in the feces, no, you don't see them. The only one you're going to see in the feces, and we'll talk about this, is the tapeworm. So you're not going to see worms in the feces. They're going to, the eggs are going to be in the feces. Roundworms are pretty sophisticated organisms. They have digestive systems. There's male and female worms. They reproduce sexually. Reproduction of worms is actually pretty darn important because of the drug resistance issues. There's differences in drug resistance based on some of the breeding of the worms. Just as an example, in Levamisol, which is called Prohibit now, resistance is sex-linked. So the theory is that if you don't use Levamisol for a number of years, which I think is what really happened in our, in our industry, it may work again versus a drug like Ivermectin where the resistance isn't sex-linked. Once they're resistant to Ivermectin, they're going to be resistant forever. Most worms, but not all, are host-specific. Sheep and goats are the same. So even though I say host-specific, sheep and goats share the same parasites. They are different from cattle. They are different from horses. There is a little bit cross-infection with the barber pole worm in a young calf. For those of you who might have llamas and alpacas, they, have, they share the parasites not only of sheep and goats, but they are also susceptible to the parasites that cattle get. However, they're probably less susceptible to parasites than sheep and goats because of the way, because of their behavior. They, they go to the bathroom basically in the same place. They don't spread their feces out like sheep and goats do, and therefore sheep and goats are more likely to ingest the infected worm larva. And once again, keep in mind, not every parasite is going to cause problems and cause disease. I mean that in a general sense, 
but even within a specific, even the barber pole worm, they have found strains of the barber pole worm that are not pathogenic. The primary parasites that affect sheep and goats are the three that I list here in this table. And, and up at the top, I basically got the uh, taxonomy of, of the worms. And basically, we get to what we call strongyles. And, and sometimes you'll even see a veterinarian will do a fecal sample, and they'll say you have strongyle type eggs. Well, these are the three parasites that, that are most problematic. Again, number one is the barber pole worm, which we call Homonchus contortus. The picture shows how it gets its name. It's uh, basically red and white, kind of like the barber shop, the thing outside the barber shop. The white is ovaries and the red is blood. This parasite is found in the abomasum, just like the first picture showed, which is the true stomach of the sheep and goat. It's the last compartment before the small intestines. The other two parasites that I list, I, I call them their cousins, the cousins of the barber pole worm. And we're less familiar with their common names, the small brown stomach worm, the black scour worm, or bankrupt worm. We, those names don't tend to roll off our tongue. The one used to be called Ostertasia, and that's actually the type species that is most problematic in cattle. They kind of changed the name. They call it Pella dorsasia is, is what they call it now. And then the other one is Trichostrongyles. Some, some of these worms are kind of hard to pronounce. The Pella dorsasia, just like the barber pole worm, is in the abomasum, whereas Trichostrongyles is actually in the first part of the small intestines. So what happens when our animals get too many of these worms? As I said, they always have them, more than likely. Oh, you can get negative fecal samples. I just did a class a couple of days ago for a 4-H club, and we did eight, eight, ten samples, and only one had any eggs in it, and it was just a couple. But when we get into the real worm season, when it's really warm and moist and ideal for these parasites, we're going to have animals that have very light infections that we can't see. You know, it's occurring, we're probably suffering a production loss. And so when animals have light infections of the barber pole worm, they may gradually lose weight, not do as well as you think they should do. They may start to become anemic. When I say loss of color, it's color in the, in the membranes. When they start to get heavily infected, they're, they're weak. They don't have stamina. The primary symptom is anemia, blood loss, protein loss. We primarily see that in a FAMACHA score, which is looking at the conjunctiva of the lower eyelid. People can also look at the gums. They can look at the skin. But it's a paleness that we see. And that's the primary symptom because the barber pole worm is a blood sucker. We may also see edema, which is an accumulation of fluid. We generally see that right under the jaw and call it bottle jaw. Contrary to what you think worms cause, the barber pole worm does not cause diarrhea. It's more likely to constipate the animal. And in many cases, we see none of this. We just see a dead animal. It can happen that fast. The other two worms, the primary symptoms that they cause, again, a light infection, we don't necessarily see. They're not doing as well as we think they should. They may have a, a kind of a dirty butt. Daggy is the kind of the, the term that's used to describe when they have fecal matter attached to their back end. When they have more significant infections, uh, obviously we can see more severe symptoms, more symptoms that affect the digestive system, particularly scouring, particularly scouring. But the thing I want you to remember is that the barber pole worm is the one that's most likely to kill them to cause death because it's sucking blood. The other two worms, it's not impossible for them to cause death, but more what we see more likely is we have production losses. They're not doing as well as they could. They're not as thrifty. They're not converting feed as well. They're not producing as much milk. They're not doing as well. A little more focus on the barber pole worm. It's most commonly a problem in warm, moist climates with summer rainfalls. So for those of us in the mid-Atlantic area, that 
describes us perfectly. Really, it describes a good bit of the, uh, of the United States, or at least the eastern half of the United States. It's just as we move farther north, the length of time where the environmental conditions are like that is longer or shorter in the north. And as we go down into the south, it's not just summer rainfalls. They can have problems almost year round. What we're also finding is that the barber pole worm is kind of like the white-tailed deer and the coyote. It's adapting. You know, things, you know, it's adapting. It's moving farther north. We're starting to identify it in very cold climates. I know it's starting to be a bigger problem in the United Kingdom, which is kind of a cool, wet environment. It definitely is the most deadly worm. It is a bloodsucker. And one of the ways that it adapts and is so successful is it produces a lot of eggs. The fact that it produces a lot of eggs and some of the other worms produce less eggs make fecal egg counting a very unexact science because you know what's a lot of eggs for the barber pole worm is quite different from what's a high egg count for some of the other types of worms. Some of the barber pole worm will overwinter, will overwinter, will survive through the winter. And I'll talk about the second part of your question as we move along. Just to give you an idea of the significance of the barber pole worm in an environment such as Maryland, and consider where you live, how this could or might not differ, but on our buck test, we collect fecal samples every two weeks. We look at the individual egg counts. We also send a sample uh, to the University of Georgia, and we'll talk about this test in our, la or in our third session, where they determine the type of parasite that we have. The three parasites that we talked about, the barber pole worm and, quote, its two cousins, the eggs look the same. You cannot tell the difference. So you have to hatch the eggs and identify them from the larva. But you can see from the green line up there, we're more than 80% and sometimes close to 100% barber pole worm during the summer uh, here in Maryland. So it's definitely by far the biggest problem. OK, a little more about these types of worms in general. They have a direct life cycle, which simply means they don't need another organism as an intermediate host. That's not true with other parasites, tapeworms, the meningeal worm, liver flukes. They all need all, uh, other hosts. Uh, how long the life cycle? It tends to be 14 to 21 days, but it's very weather dependent. I suspect when it's we're in the middle of the summer, and if it's warm and the moisture is there, it could probably be below 14 days for the barber pole worm. So it's very weather dependent. As we're early in the spring or move late in the fall, that life cycle is going to stretch out. The picture there shows the basic life cycle. When the sheep poops, there's eggs in the poop. If the weather conditions are, are good for it, it will hatch. It will go through a couple of stages till it gets to what I have there is the L3. That's the infective stage. That's the, the, the larva that the sheep or goat is going to consume when it grazes, when it grazes. Once inside of the animal, it will develop into an L4, which is basically an immature worm. That L4 will suck blood. And then it'll develop into an adult, which will also suck blood and lay eggs. And of course, that cycle will continue unless we do something to disrupt it or if weather shuts it down or delays it. Most of the cycle of a worm, 90% of it, takes place outside of the animal, outside of the animal. As I mentioned, you can't tell the difference between the different types of eggs. I don't know how well you can see that picture but they very much look the same. They look kind of like an oval shape with a, a bunch of grapes inside. It's very common for sheep and goats to have all of these types of worms in them. And the mixture or the ratios will vary maybe by time of year. It can vary by geographic region. It can vary by the type of parasite control that you have. There's a research farm down in Arkansas that's been using parasite control that is only effective on the barber pole worm. As a result, they've controlled the barber pole worm, and now they have a higher percentage of these other types of strongyles. All of these worms have developed varying degrees of resistance to the anthelmintics or dewormers. 
That resistance varies by geographic region. Again, it's not as likely to be as high in, in Connecticut as it is in Maryland, not as likely to be high as high in Maryland as it is in Louisiana, probably because of how much we've had to use the amphometrics. It's also going to vary by farm, how much you have used a particular drug, with what frequency, the manner in which you've given it. I suspect on my farm that they're all still effective because I don't deworm, I very rarely deworm, so I would think they would still work. Uh, it's just going to depend. Our goat test last year, we deworm the goats when they come with two dewormers with the idea of trying to eliminate their parasites so they can start the test on equal ground. Last year, Levamisol was not on the market, so we used Cydectin and Valbazin. We only got 33% reduction in egg count. That's a very high degree of resistance to that combination of drugs. In previous years, our combination of Levamisol and Cydectin reduced egg counts by more than 95%. Question about how long the, they can stay in the L3 stage. Is, it, it varies because some of them, as indicated before, some of them will overwinter. Some of them will die off immediately. So it's like the longer you rest the pasture, the, long, the more eggs and larvae are going to die off. But in 30 days, there's still L3s out there. In 60 days, there's a lot fewer. In a year, they're probably all gone. So it varies. It's important to understand how the parasites interact with the environment. As I've indicated, the optimal conditions are warm and moist. Humid, over 82 degrees, humidity above 70%. That describes summers in Maryland. There's a little bit of difference to the species in terms of how they're affected by the weather. I like these two graphs. They show the larva numbers on pasture. So we're not inside of the animal, we're looking at what's on pasture. And in a normal year, if we ever get a normal year, you notice that the parasite or the larva, and these are the L3s, they begin to climb in early summer and they reach a peak in summer, in the middle of summer, and they stay up there. There's a good chance they stay up there, unless we do something. In a dry year, and that's the line all the way down at the bottom, they basically stay low all, year, all the whole time. And that's what we experienced in our goat test last year. Once we solved the problems of what they came in with, we had no parasite issues because we got no rainfall. And so the, the, the well, I should say the egg count numbers were real low. We don't, we don't actually measure pasture larva. That's a lot harder. We don't do that. We look at egg counts, which would be our indication of, of the level of infection. What happens a lot of times is you'll have a dry summer, and this happens in most of the other years we've had the goats. It's dry, so we figure there aren't any problems. So we kind of don't worry about it, and then it gets wet in the fall, and we kind of get caught off guard. The other graphic basically shows you some of the same things with a, couple, with a, a noteworthy difference. One, you see that first hump, and then um, and then you see the, the increase in the, in the autumn. I actually think, as I look at this, this must be one from, um, I must have pulled this from Australia, because this isn't really suiting, it isn't really suiting, they're not labeled right. It doesn't look like, if you look at how I have it, it's not labeled right. I've got the months labeled wrong. Because what it's supposed to show is that first blip is around the time of lambing and kidding, because at that time, the U and the doe, the immunity that they have built up with age is relaxed at the time of lambing and kidding, so you get that increase in egg count, and then you follow the same thing to increasing in the summer. So yeah, that is not labeled properly. I apologize for that. I think it might have been pulled from Australia, or just mislabeled on my part. I'll fix that when I, I'll try to get that fixed. But there was a question about uh, the L3 surviving inside uh, the animal. One of the things that helps these parasites be successful is the fact that they can go into basically, they call it hypobiosis. You can just think of it as hibernation. And this is not the L3s, it's the L4s. 
that immature worm. And they can basically stop development. Somehow they know that the environmental conditions aren't proper for them, and they just stop development and stay in the stomach for three to four months. And, and there's lots of reasons why they might do this, and, it, and when they do it might depend on, again, your geographic location. If there's not enough moisture or the temperatures are, are too cool, which is typically what we see in Maryland as we, as we go into the late fall and winter, it's too cold. So they go basically into this hypobiosis. It's how they survive. Uh, as a picture of my sheep from a couple years ago when we got a lot of snow, you know, I look at those sheep and say, you know, I don't really care about worms. They're not a problem this time of the year. But at the same time, they probably got some inside of them. The host isn't affected by these, this hypobiosis, but it certainly comes into play when we think about how we're going to manage them, what we may deworm an animal with. There's a question about how far up the grass will um, parasites, the larva, migrate. We are going to talk about that in the second session because it is important. The larva is going to stay where the moisture is. It's going to stay where the moisture is. And so it's really going to be in that first two, two or three inches. They say about 80% of the larva is in the first two or three inches. And that's important to us because that can affect how we manage our pastures. Uh, parasites don't have flippers. They don't have wings. They, they're with the moisture. The drier it is, the farther down they're going to be. It does matter what type of plant. They're going to, uh, you know, the, an animal's going to be far more likely to ingest infected larva with, say, a straight grass plant versus a legume versus uh, something like chicory. So yeah, there are those differences, and we're going to talk about that, like I said, in our second uh, webinar next week. Let's talk a little bit about all the other ones that are possible. There are other parasites that can affect sheep and goats. They can be an occasional problem because you're at a certain geographic location or just for some oddball reason sometimes because they don't read the book and know that barber pole worm is the problem. Or you may see eggs. When I get my fecals of my goats analyzed in Georgia, I'll sometimes see these other worm eggs identified. It's just a point of interest because it doesn't mean anything. They're, they don't contribute to the count, but they will occasionally find them. I will tell you that the one third down on the left, the Matadirus, uh, I know that one tends to be a problem the farther we move north. It tends to be more of a problem in an environment like the United Kingdom. I did some programs in the Atlantic provinces of Canada last year, and I think it's more significant problem up there. It doesn't lay a lot of eggs, so, you know, it, there's some differences with it. It does look different, the egg, and I'll show you, I have a picture of the eggs, I think, in my last slide, but it, it's very, looks the same, but it's a much larger egg. The, the ones on the right, I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Uh, one is lungworms. And the other one is the meningeal worm. They're still all nematodes. They're still all strongyles. They're still all round worms. These, again, don't tend to be a problem. Sometimes they don't even tend to be pathogenic, even if they had a significant number of them. But you always keep things in the back of your mind, just in case they didn't read the book. I mentioned lungworms for one primary reason, is when sheep and goats cough or have snotty noses, people often assume it's lungworms. Well, one of the problems with lungworms is it's very difficult to diagnose them. You know, a persistent cough or respiratory problems or reduced weight gains are all signs of lungworms, but they're not definitive. There's so many other things that could be a problem. If you do a fecal sample, you don't see the eggs. You may see the larva. Uh, primarily, lungworms are a problem that tend to be identified at necropsy. Uh, we don't tend to be able to diagnose them in the live animal. When we do deworm animals for the stomach worms, those same drugs are effective against the lungworms. But just to, to, to say, I'm not saying they're not, not, not pathogenic, but they don't tend to, to cause a, a significant problem. The one that's an exception, and I've actually got several slides on this one, is the meningeal worm. This is a parasite of the white-tailed deer, which is the natural host. 
typically doesn't cause a problem not pathogenic in the deer. When it gets into a natural, unnatural host, a sheep, a goat, a llama, an alpaca, a moose, a horse, it causes severe neurological disease. It basically gets in the system, has nowhere to go, and as it travels up the spinal cord to the head, it just causes symptoms and causes problems. Gastropods, which basically is a terrestrial snail or a slug, are the intermediate host. That's what the sheep or goat eat. Again, the parasite, they will ingest the parasite into their digestive system. About 10 days to two weeks later, that parasite will cross the blood-brain barrier and migrate to the spinal cord on its way to the brain to kill the animal. The symptoms that you see uh, are variable and depend on where that parasite is, and they also look very similar to other neurological diseases. may start out as a simple weakness or lameness, may lead to a complete paralysis to ultimately death. Ironically, they often still have quite an appetite. We had an outbreak of this parasite about seven years ago, the first time we had any goats at our research center. And uh, we had about nine of them affected with it. We followed the recommended treatment, which I want you to know, we don't know really if it works. There's no studies that say it works or doesn't work. We followed a treatment such as this, and perhaps the goats weren't that severely affected. And most of them, I think all of them got better except one that escaped the treatment pen and ultimately did die from meningeal worm. Ivermectin and fenbendazole are the drugs of choice. Higher doses, very often anti-inflammatory drugs are given. Dexamethasone to a non-pregnant animal. They may get better on their own. They may never get better. The treatment may work. This is picture, I think, is from Michigan State University is of, of a sheep that's affected with the meningeal worm. It's a very different kind of parasite than the stomach worms, than coccidia, and a much more difficult one to deal with. Obviously, it's better to prevent problems, much like it is with all diseases and parasites. Not too much you can do about deer when you think about it. You can't go out and kill them all. Deer-proof fencing is very expensive unless you're a very small operation. How do you make your pastures less appealing to deer? You know, those are really hard things to do. The, more, the better control point could be the snail and slug habitat and not giving animals access to pastures that contain an ideal habitat for them, thick vegetation, you know, shaded moist areas. In extreme circumstances, and very often this is done with uh, llamas and alpacas who seem to be more severely affected, is that you do give anthelmintics, and again, ivermectin as a, as a drug of choice, every 10 to 14 days. I've seen where they've said every 30 days, but when you think about it, every 30 days doesn't make sense because it only takes 10 to 14 days to go from the digestive system to the central nervous system, and we really don't know if the drugs are going to be effective once they cross the blood-brain barrier. So realistically, if you really had a severe problem, you would have to do it every 10 to 14 days. You'd render those drugs useless for stomach worms because the resistance would be high and very quick. But there are some situations where the meningeal worm is such a problem that you may have to go to this route. That's the, the nematodes, the roundworms. I want to work back to the original slide with, with all the different types of worms on it and talk a little bit about cestodes or tapeworm. I think this is everybody's favorite worm because you can see it and it's gross and it's big. Tapeworms of course are flat, they're segmented, from a, uh, they're not as sophisticated as the roundworms, they're hermaphrodites, meaning they have both sexes. They have an indirect life cycle, they need a pasture mite, of course there's no shortage of pasture mites, it's just the common mite. The life cycle I think is about six weeks, I think actually that might be on the next slide. And there is some, an example of where sheep and goats are actually the intermediate host for a tapeworm, and I'll talk about that one a little bit. Primarily the tapeworm that affects sheep and goats is called, it's mo I don't even know if I say it right, but monazea. There's species in that, and that's the ones that affect sheep and goats. Again, an indirect life cycle with a pasture mite, a longer life cycle than the stomach worms. The only parasite that we can see, and that's why it freaks us out.
It can't be good if we can see it. It can't be good if it's hanging out of their butt. But guess what? For the most part, it's non-pathogenic and of little consequence. Mo almost all research I've ever seen, except maybe one study, shows that there's no reason to treat. You don't, you don't improve anything. You don't make the animal healthier. You don't make it grow faster. There's no benefit to treating. Now, just like those other stomach worms, though, I always want you to keep it in the back of your mind. You know, they can't, there can be enough tapeworms in an animal system to cause an intestinal blockage. That would be the severe case. It's my understanding that if that an animal can have a lot of tapeworms in its system and it still not be a problem. It's hard to imagine, but that's what they say. And the other thing I want to always keep in the back of my mind, too, is that I never found any research with goats. I only see sheep research. I don't think I think tapeworm research is hard to do. I've only seen it on sheep, and so I always, again, like to to keep in the back of my mind possibilities. And perhaps goats, because they're more susceptible to the other ones, maybe they're more susceptible to tapes. If you do feel like you need to treat for tapeworms, you have to use very specific amphalmintics, which is basically albendazole and fenbendazole. The last one, which I can't even pronounce. Uh, there is really no product other than it's in an ivermectin product, I believe. Uh, a lot of other countries have, have that drug in, uh, in combination drugs, but we basically have valbazin, and then if Safeguard is used, you have to double the uh, dosage uh, on the label. It's not indicated for tapeworms. Again, we'll talk about the drugs in the last uh, session. Ironically, the picture you see here of this lamb passing a tapeworm is my most popular picture on Flickr, which is an image sharing site. It's amazing. I don't know, a half a million people have viewed that picture. You want to know what I did with that lamb? I took his picture and then I went in the house. I did nothing for that lamb. Because again, it's not pathogenic. A problem that does exist with tapeworms, and I'm not saying it exists in Maryland, but I know it's a problem in, in the western United States, is sheep and goats are intermediate host for a tapeworm that affects dogs. And so sheep get infected when they eat forages that have been contaminated by dogs. And of course, a lot of us have guardian dogs. A lot of people have herding dogs. Unfortunately, there's a lot of other types of dogs or canines that could also be involved. They host the larval stage of the parasite. doesn't make them sick. But as you can see in the pictures, it causes cysts in the meat, which could result in the carcass being condemned. Again, I, I've talked to inspectors in Maryland, and I'm not aware that we have a problem in, in here. But I know out west, when they look at feedlot lambs, they've had some, some situation. The control point for this is not the sheep, it's the dog. It's keeping the dog dewormed. And also just good management, because you don't want any kind of animal eating carcasses. And that includes uh, you know, wild animals. So you want to make sure you definitely compost or, or do something to get rid of any type of carcass. And not feed your dogs uh, uncooked meat. OK, the third type of parasite is the uh, trematodes or flukes. And they're really cool looking. They're, I've never seen one for real. When you do a fecal sample, they actually sink. So you would need to do fecal samples completely different if you ever did want to find them. But just you can see from the picture, they're oval shaped. Similar to tapeworms, they have an indirect life cycle. Only their host, like the meningeal worm, is, is the snail or the slug. And they're also a hermaphrodite, both sexes. Uh, the common liver fluke, the name is listed there. If you read the book, we don't have them in Maryland. We may not have them in your state. Again, it's something I always want you to keep in the back of your mind as always a possibility. Symptoms are very similar to barber pole worm. They cause the anemia and the bottle jaw. The only drug that we have for treating tapeworms is valbazin, which is a sheep approved drug. It also has a conditional license for liver flukes on goats most likely to be a problem where it's wet because again it needs the snail or the slug and as you can see from this image from South Africa it's very much related to the water when animals are around ponds and things like that this is where it's more likely to be a problem and obviously it causes causes damage to the liver the other major parasite and like I said there can be circumstances where it's just a bigger problem are the protozoan parasites and of course here really we just mean coccidia I'm not too concerned about the other ones, not from a production standpoint. The last one, Taxoplasma gondii, that's actually a co the coccidia that cats get. That one is important. It can cause abortions in sheep and goats, and it can cause a woman to miscarry. 
Okay, we're not really going to focus on that parasite, but that is, does fall into that category, and it, and it can be a problem. So coccidia can be a major problem raising sheep and goats. Again, they're single cell. They have a very complicated life cycle. The picture that shows here doesn't show you nearly how complicated it is. There's many stages. We don't call them eggs. We call them oocytes. They call it sporulation. They have spores and they hatch. They have a part of their cycle where they sexually reproduce or asexually reproduce. So it's a very complicated cycle. It's about 21 days. They also like warmth and moisture. Far more likely to be a problem in the barn or in areas where uh, things are congregated. It's about 10 different species known to affect sheep and goats. Two things that are important. Well, the fact that they're host specific and sheep and goats don't really share the same one, I don't know how significant knowledge that is, but that's basically um, what they have found out. They've not even really been able to tr cross transmit coccidia between sheep and goats. They're not all pathogenic. This makes fecals, when you have a fecal done and you get a coccidia count, you actually don't know whether they're pathogenic or not. It's kind of like when you do the stomach worms. You don't know which ones they are. You just get an egg count of the strongyle type worms. Well, with coccidia, you get a count of all the coccidia oocytes, but you really don't know which ones are a problem. So you have to use the fecal sample to some degree with, with a grain of salt, but just like fecal samples for um, the stomach worms, it's only a little bit of part of the picture. You really need to look more at circumstances, the environment, and the clinical signs that you're seeing in the animal. Coccidia focus on the small intestines. Just like the other parasites, we've got both a subclinical and clinical infection. I think we suffer a great deal of loss on the subclinical side, where, where we're not getting the performance, uh, the growth, the thriftiness out of our lambs and kids that we'd like to, but yet we're not sure, you know, we don't necessarily notice it as a disease problem that we need to go out and treat for. We usually end up at the second place as we see clinical signs, the most common being diarrhea. But keep in mind, they can be affected with coccidia without having diarrhea or bad diarrhea, and they can also be affected with having, not having a lot of oocytes in their, uh, in their fecal. And we actually can take a little bit different approach to coccidia than we do the stomach worms. We actually can do some prophylactic treating with coccidia, and we really don't have that luxury with the stomach worms. So I think we can actually have a better handle on subclinical coccidiosis than we can on subclinical stomach worms. Because if we start treating to prevent problems with stomach worms, that's what's got us to the drug resistance issues. With coccidia, we need to be careful too. We don't want to treat year round or, or treat prophylactically year round or we're going to have the same problems. They're going to develop resistance. But we can do it more strategically you know, coccidia can be dealt with more strategically, whereas worms, it's a little bit harder. This just basically summarizes the different types of internal parasites that sheep and goats can get. You know, and again, if, the, if I were to point out the significant ones, it's the barber pole worm and coccidia are the ones that we're primarily concerned about. The teledorsasia and the trichostrongyles are more than likely going to be part of a mixed infection with barber pole worm and just kind of adding to the poor performance or poor growth or, or unthriftiness of that animal. What uh, can make things challenging, again, if I think of symptoms where the anemia and the bottle jaw are pretty clearly barber pole worm, you know, you can get it with liver flukes, but liver flukes aren't a huge problem. That one's fairly easy to differentiate. Coccidia and the other stomach worms, scouring, unthriftiness, poor quality hair coat, they're all pretty similar. So it can be very hard to differentiate between those two. You know, a fecal can help identify the approximate numbers, but they both can cause very similar types of symptoms. And of course, they're treated with very different types of products. You have a coccidia problem and you give the animal a dewormer, you're not going to have any effect on it. Again, we're going to talk about some of the pharmaceutical approaches in our last session. This, I, and I believe, is my last slide. This is just a, a, um, a picture of what the eggs look like. Or in the case of lungworm, that's a picture of the larva. This is a picture done by InterVet, which 
is the manufacturer of Safeguard and also some CD&T vaccines. They look, I think they all look somewhat different to you, but hopefully you see, if you look at Ostertasia, which again is the Teledorsasia, the small brown stomach worm, below it is Homonchus, and then a couple over is Trichostrongyles. They may look a little different in the picture, but when you're looking at them under a microscope, they look the same. I can tell you they very much look the same. The nematodirus is what they all look like small, but nematodirus is a giant one and uh, really easy to identify if, if you see it. And in all the years I've been doing my workshops, we've only seen a couple of the nematodirus eggs. Some of these other ones are um, tapeworm eggs are pretty easy to see. I can tell you that we, we have rarely seen them. They're kind of triangular shaped. The hookworm up in the upper right corner, I have people say, well, my vet saw hookworms. And, and that may well be true. They can get them, but they also look very similar to the other types of eggs. Coccidia are much smaller. While the colors of these eggs are not realistic, you know, nematodirus is not a big green egg, lungworms aren't purple, the, the sizes are correct. So coccidia are much smaller. There's a lot of different strains of coccidia. Some of them appear to have a little cap on them, but they're a much smaller egg than the other ones. And we'll talk about fecals in our uh, third session. And that's going to conclude this.